Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Scale Trains YouTube channel. This is our first All About Scale Trains since our rebranding. So I'm hanging out here with my good friends, Harry Wong from Railroad Model Craftsman, Tony Cook from Model Railroad News, and Paul Ellis. He's the GP30 project manager and a Scale Trains co-founder. Really happy to have you all here joining us for our GP30 live stream. And uh, also, this is our first live stream since we went through the rebrand. So I've got my new Scale Trains hat, uh, got the new logo. Actually, I'm not used to just telling Harry, I'm not used to having the, the non-mirrored image. I actually look like myself in the screen. So anyway, happy to have the new logo um, and all of you here joining for the live chat. So um, tonight we're going to have an opportunity where everyone can ask questions after we go through um, each road name. We're going to go through the railroad road number and era specific details of each road name, give you a little bit of GP30 history here. After we go through each road name, we'll have a Q&A session where, where you will be able to ask questions about the project, about future road names, all that good stuff. And <clears throat> I'll just start out by saying, if there was a class one that had a GP30, we probably are going to do it at some point, but we're going to take those questions later towards the end of the stream. So before we get going, I want to uh, share the scale trains announcement video and this announcement was a little bit different so a lot of folks don't really realize all that is involved with bringing deco samples um, for product announcements and these deco samples were, were being worked on for a long time coming but unfortunately we did not have a working sample uh, everything kind of came down to the wire so we weren't able to do our, our typical product video where you can see all the lights and sound and all that good stuff so we're going to watch the product announcement video. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll play it here, and then we'll get to the meat and potatoes of the GP30 project. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. A new era continues with our all-new HO Scale EMD GP30. The first GP30s rolled off of EMD's assembly line during the summer of 1961. Many lasted decades with the final units retiring in the 2000s. Our rivet counter model continues our tradition of railroad, road number, and era specific details. For the first time in mass produced plastic, we're offering Union Pacific GP30Bs in both freight and passenger versions to go along with UP cab units. We're also producing the unique CSX RDMT slug units. Additional road names include Chicago and Northwestern in the OY scheme, including a unique repaint, Norfolk and Western High Hoods in Pebbler Blue, Pennsylvania Railroad with train phone antennas, Rio Grande in four road numbers with the small flying Rio Grande and two with the large billboard lettering. For complete details, visit our website at scaletrains.com. Many more railroads, paint schemes and variations will follow on future production runs, including Chessy System GP30Ms, BN and BNSF GP39Es, and Santa Fe GP30Us. Pre-order now at scaletrains.com and select retailers for fall 2022 delivery. So there you have it. That is our GP30 product announcement video, like I was saying earlier. We didn't have a running sample, but that is uh, soon to change. We'll eventually have a running sample and we will do a uh, full-on product video. We're going to show the lights, the sound, the whole nine yards. Really excited about that. So guys, I just wanted to dive right into the GP30 project. You know, um, when it comes to bringing an HO scale locomotive to market, a lot of times it takes years to get to the point of an actual product announcement. And that's what I want to ask uh, Paul Ellis here about. So Paul, tell me about the GP30 project. When did you guys first start looking at uh, doing a GP30? Um, and, and how did that ball get rolling? Um, probably late summer of 2018, roughly, is when we started saying, you know, hey, the GP30, that's probably the next locomotive we should look at doing. And, um, you know, let's go, let's green light and get started. And so from there, um, Mike Hoppin and myself, we started the whole process of, you know, okay, gathering up all the documentation of the prototype, whether it's drawings, photos, and whatnot. And um, luckily, we've got some examples that are still with us that, that we can document in person. Um, the one that's close to Mike and myself is the one that's at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Boulder, Boulder, Nevada, um, UP 844. And luckily, we were able to obtain permission to go visit it, as well as um, we arranged to have a laser scan, 
laser, LIDAR scan to help try to capture some of those unique contours that you see on the GP30. And so we made that trip in uh, January of 2019 to get the ball rolling, so to speak. And at the same time, um, Shane and one of our good friend, Todd Arnett, they made a trip to the uh, North Carolina Transportation Museum to measure and photograph um, Southern 2601, is you know, the unique high nose unit. And from all those photos and drawings and work with our design engineers, this is where we came up. This is where we landed all these years later, you know, that we finally have the, I finally have the models in hand. So there we go. Yeah. Pretty cool. I like that one a lot because of the unique uh, sunshades on the on the UP version. Pretty cool. Yeah. And there's the A44. Yeah. The so Paul, <laughs> we've gotten a lot of questions about the UP gray on the A44. Yeah. What what's the deal with that? Why does it look a little off? That is how the that's how the real one looked as of uh, January 2019 when Mike when Mike and I were visiting. Um, it had been freshly repainted, and um, that's that's the shade of gray that it's it was fairly fresh when we saw it and, and documented it. And there's yeah, there's a shot one of the shots I took of it, and it's um, that's pretty much how it looks today. Um, and if, 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 you, if anybody with, with, with the sharp eyes will notice those little round circles, those little balls, those little spheres on, on you know, little golf balls on tees, like there's one in front of the. Uh, in front of the pilot under the coupler and another one next to the fuel tank, those are laser calibration um, circles or whatever that our laser scan guy was using to help calibrate the the setup for that when we had it scanned as well. So, but um, now that's, we, we modeled UP-44 as it looked as of that visit. So um, any, you'll notice it's got a few little deviations from the normal UP practice with you know, like the upper stripes a little bit thicker than the, what the way it would normally would be. And then when we visited, it was sporting a K5 LA horn, which is kind of neat. Wow. So yeah, it's uh, and also and also uniquely since it's, it's it's a running 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 unit, they use it to pull excursion trains, and so it has ditch lights front and rear, which we've also glued our model. Hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the things I was going to ask about. You know, in the product announcement video that we just played, we talk about future runs and things like that, and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ditch lights are a big deal if, if a manufacturer was to offer a modernized GP30, which has never been done before. So, you know, mm -hmm. the good thing that people uh, can take away from the 844 is that the tooling is there to do versions with ditch lights. So there will be modernized versions, as we said. Um, Paul, just give me a little bit of history on the 844. So um, this locomotive was delivered in 1961 or two. Uh, 62, I believe. I might have to go back and look at my roster info here, but that was pretty much when, when one of the, uh, a good deal of GP30 production took place. Give me one second, I can look it up. But, um, yeah, the 30, I mean, for all intents and it's a, it's a early 1930s locomotive. I mean, 1960s locomotive, excuse me. And, um, you know, it, it was kind of a, bridge between the first generation, you know, looking at like the GP7 and 9, 18 and 20, to that, to this new generation with, with that introduced, you know, production turbo, well, after the 20, you know, the, they also included turbocharging as well as a whole redesigned car body, um, press, you know, pressurized car body. Other creatures that are pretty innovative at the time. Uh, hang on a second here. Uh, yeah, UP844, it was a, it was part of a group that was built between and between August and September, excuse me, August, August, August and October, 1962. Gotcha. So. Yeah, and so one of the things about the 844 is that when that 800 series of GP30s was being added to the UP roster, they had to renumber the steam locomotive 844 mm -hmm. because it was a conflict in in the books. So. That was kind of interesting, and, and I read somewhere from, I believe, 1962 to 1989, the 844 was the 8444. Right. So this is the locomotive that was the reason why they had to renumber it for all those years. So um, pretty cool that we're being able to offer that in HO, and um, that kind of leads me to the other Union Pacific version. So, um, you know, one of the things that we like to try to do is is push the boundaries in terms of HO and in scale, and now coming on to F scale. Um, and one of those things that we're doing is we're offering Union Pacific B units for the first time in HO scale in plastic. And uh, I'm sure Tony's got a picture somewhere that we can show. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that 
we're really excited for because it's never been done before. Um, having both the passenger B unit, which actually has the, the steam heater vents on top of it. I'm going to bring up my screen here so we can show um, a picture of the model. And Paul's got it right there. Yep, we've got the full full complement of steam generator details with the um, exhaust vents and intakes. And also on the on the units that have the steam generator equipment, they add extra extra doors. I can't, it's hard to see with the lighting, but extra doors, where, roughly where we see the dependable transportation lettering for accessing the, uh, the steam generator equipment. And last but not least, they had an extended walkway on both sides. Um, you see right here on my fingers pointing, that was a water fill hatch or opening for, you know, fill the water for the boiler and had that on both sides. In contrast that with the standard GP30, that was that was shorter in that section and had uh, two short stances instead of one, one short like he's in the, on the passenger 30. And here's a photo that, that Tony has of uh, 704B. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful photo. And this was one of the freight ones, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But for the most part, they were they were pretty there, with the exception of the steam generator equipment and the length and walkway duct on both sides for the water fill. They were pretty otherwise they were pretty much identical. So, Paul, what were some of the materials that you guys used to study the B units? Because there aren't any B units around anymore. So, how did the, how, what kind of resources did you guys go to uh, to to get those details nailed down? Um, just a lot of photos, um, like what as we typically do for for any examples of things that are no longer with us. Um, just start going through photographs and books. Um, you know, there have been a lot of Union Pacific um, motor power annuals published over the years, and you know, that there are good studies of locomotives that the EP's owned, a lot of good photographs to reference, as well as going to a lot of our sources, like um, friend Dick Harley, who's really well known in the uh, out here on the West Coast as a UP historian extraordinaire. Um, he came through with a lot of information and, and even artwork and other, other technical, technical data on the DP gp 30s Including the B units, um, so we have a lot of we have a lot of sources we can we can tap. Whether it's uh, photographs that we are in our own collection with slides that we acquire, books, as well as you know the human resources that we go to, that are different contacts that we've known, relationships we've built over the years that we folks that we can go to and trust that will give us accurate information on a lot of these different projects. So Harry, you've been in the model railroad industry forever, and you know. <laughs> A lot of us have, have always been into trains our entire lives, but you've, you've actually been in the industry for many, many years. So, you know, obviously uh, a GP30B is something that we've been asked uh, for a lot. Um, yeah. How often over the years have you heard, man, we, we really need some accurate Union Pacific GP30s? You know, um, we've had different instances of GP30s over the years. Um, I, I, Tony knows much better than I, actually. I mean, um, I think it started all the way back before I was even born, which was the Atherin G30. Um, oh, yeah. and, uh, I never saw that. You know, people always talked about it at the model railroad clubs when I was a kid. Do you have an Atherin G30? Oh yeah, yeah, I really do. And yeah, and yeah. Um, you know, and it was just this complete mystery to me. You know, Tony's got a yeah. few good shots there. Yeah. And, oh, here we go. Yeah, and and when I actually saw one, I was like, <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> you know yeah and I was you like, know, gosh my, my tyco c430 blows that away i didn't have much tyco but but uh, if i did it would still blow this away and <laughs> uh you know so i was saying you know i'm not so sure if i want to pine so much for one anymore i'm sorry i asked <laughs> but uh, later on there became other iterations from other companies lionel came out with a nice one or the first nice one and uh, it did not have a very good drive and so people threw those over other chassis from, from Atherne and, and a bunch of other people. Um, and so that's what we had to live with uh, when I grew up was, was this thing, you know, the, the, the Lionel one, which later be, well, where did it go after that, Tony? Uh, it, it's part of Lionel's 70s HO. It's in 75.6. It's made by Cater in Hong Kong. And then after Lionel exits in 78, <clears throat> it joins Bachman's line in 79. Right. It's been there since. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first one of the first two Spectrum diesels in '89, and it's yeah. come back again. That's a Lionel there in the center in Santa Fe Superfleet before there was Superfleet. Right. <laughs> and then the proto, the, the proto at the side there is you know the '90s. Right, right. That wasn't a bad one. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and and uh, so we've been living with Jeep 30s forever. I mean, you know, and and uh, with with these models, I had friends uh, ask about them also, and I said, yeah, don't, don't worry about the Ather and Jeep 30. Let's let's look for some other ones. And and so Tony just outlined the other ones that we actually found and that we actually enjoyed for for a few years. Yeah, and and one of the things that I'll just say as a, as a young guy, you know, I'm 25 and. Just to see, you know, you get some of these old uh, model railroaders from way back when. And <laughs> there's actually a model railroader um, that I really love from 1984. And it's actually about the Southern Railway Murphy branch. And, you know, uh, our headquarters are in Benton, Tennessee, only about an hour from, well, not even an hour, maybe 40 minutes from Murphy. And um, so I've always loved that, that article. And back then to have an accurate Southern SD40-2 out of plastic. You had to do so much work. You had to buy a Canon high hood kit. You had to yep. buy all the brass parts for the walkway lights. Um, on and on and on. The the stuff that you had to do. And and back then you didn't really have sound. I mean, there really wasn't sound at all. Um, you just kind of had to enjoy your trains with the with the low hum of, of the motors. And hopefully you had a good motor. Um, you know. And so it was just back then seeing the the, the evolution of how far the hobby has come over the last 40 years is, is really incredible. And that's what we're all about is those railroad road number and era specific details. Um, from the very beginning, when the, when the company first started, um, we're carrying on that tradition today. So, um, very cool, very cool to hear that. And, uh, Tony, these are some great pictures that you're sharing this, this photo. I really like that I'm showing right here. This is the, the EMD demonstrator. And, uh, kind of interesting story paul it was originally supposed to be called the gp22 right yeah yeah that was the original designation for it it is um at the when the time that emd was developing it that fell in line with their numbering system that was, that was in place during the, the late 50s early 60s um but then you had this upstart kid called the u25b show up from general electric and emd's like hmm okay um Let's let's try to make let's try to differentiate this locomotive from everybody from this new get the, the new GE offering, and so the marketing guys you know say hey let's say this thing is is let's uh, try to one up them one up them in the model designation that's called the GP30 and you know tout that it has thirty you know revolutionary improvements over pre, over previous models, and so from there on we have the GP30, and in the picture we see up there here's the, yeah, here's our look here's that's the 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 father of the GP30 as we know that we know it today with the with that weird uh, roof line you know, over the cab and the uh, the inset blower housing on the left hand side and the access slots on the side sill it was markedly different than production versions but uh, it was a uh, definitely unique locomotive when it first when it first when it was first introduced that's really cool so they actually took uh, the prototype uh, locomotive for the series and did the picture that Tony showed earlier, the, the artist's rendering, did they actually add the, the new, I guess you'd call it streamlined roof to it and change the blower housing on the side on that particular unit? On this particular unit, if I'm, if my, if my, if going from memory, I think I read that, that this particular unit that's up on the screen, I think that wound up with UP. I don't know, Harry, yeah. you, yeah. Yeah, did. Yeah. yeah. I think I read that they actually, UP actually went oh, back. Oh, wow. Years. Yeah, in fact, in fact some, I, I think it was, um, a UP, a former UP employee, he has a website called Utah Rails. I think Don Strack, Strack. Think yeah. Yeah. Warren Johnson, they recalled, you know, having a look at this 875 as it looked on, you know, after UP got a hold of it, they said you could still see where EMD, before they shipped it off, they filled in the forward portion of the roof um, roof <laughs> line, or whatever you call it. But another feature that, that really shows from this shot that kind of carries over from predecessor models, you can see the class lights. It's got those bugged out GP79, you know, SD24 style class lights on the nose instead of the, the flush style that the GP30 introduced. So it was, you know, it was an interesting model, you know, as far as all the production, all the different, uh, you know, features on it. That, uh, again, it was kind of bridging the gap between the first and second generation. That's really cool. And yeah, that's really truly what the GP30 is, is the, the, the beginning of the second generation of EMD models. And, uh, I always thought it was interesting that they they never ended up coming out with a a, a six axle version of it, and I can't <laughs> quite remember why. Why isn't it because they were coming out with SD thirty fives like right around that time, and they were like, ah, eh, we'll just you know go with the SD thirty five. Yeah, I think that was part of the reasoning. If I remember correctly, I, I 
I know there have been some some um, fantasy models that modelers have built up of an SD30, which actually look kind of cool. But uh, uh, for whatever reason, EMD didn't proceed. Didn't I'm not sure. Well, I'm not even sure if they offer one in the catalog or that nobody and that nobody. Yeah, did. I think the 24 was still in the catalog at the time. Yeah. I mean, they were yeah. trying to hawk that SD24 to Southern Pacific, and uh, yeah. they didn't get anywhere with that. And uh, right. the 24 actually didn't have much traction. So yeah. I think uh, EMD decided to just sit back and punt with uh, until the 35 line came along. Yeah. Interesting. It's it's always interesting to look back and see where these manufacturers were at and some of the reasons why, you know, like some of the trade-in programs, uh, you, know, you get Alco trucks and things like that on EMDs, and that was always interesting to see. So very cool, uh, cool to learn more about the demonstrator. So let's move on to the next road name. Uh, we're going to look at Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, of course, Pennsylvania Railroad, Brunswick Green, um, a pretty Spartan look. Um, as, as Paul would say, um, you know, just your Keystone logos on the nose, a little small one there on the side. And then what really stands out with, uh, with Penzi is the train phone antennas and also uh, the box there on the, by the engineer's um, window there. And then, of course, the horns uh, atop the, the side of the window. So, Paul, tell me a little bit about Pennsylvania Railroad's GP30s. Yeah, as far as the as far as looks go, the Penzi's G30s they are up there with SPs because that um, you know that that train phone antenna system you know that the proprietary system that Penzi used um, earlier early former radio radio communications I couldn't tell you how exactly how it worked, but uh, either way it involved this this series of um, antenna conduits or antennas that were strung up along those stances up along the long hood roof line from front to back, and you know, so you combine that with the uh, with the uh, you know, the, the cab signal cabinet that was mounted on the on the walkway in front of the engineer's side of the cab, and um, you know, and then, then that you know that DGLE paint job, and they were really unique looking units at the end of the day. You know, they and uh, and interestingly enough, the you know the, the induction that train induction train fuel system didn't last all that long, from my understanding. Before you know, more conventional types of radio equipment were installed, and and then when that happened, they basically torched off the those stanchions and left the little mounting studs, whatever you want to call them, on the on the hood on the edges on the corners of the roof line. And you can see that if you look at units that have been repainted for com rail or PC in later years. Yeah, um, there's actually a uh, GP30 on a on a short line in Indiana, <clears throat> excuse me, called the Indiana Northeastern. Mm -hmm. I've actually been all over that locomotive and they just like you were saying that you can see where the stanchion used to be on the cab mm -hmm. roof line. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the cool things about the Indiana Northeastern. Um, their their Penzi uh, GP30 is all original. It wasn't rebuilt, so it's and it even has working class lights and everything. So mm. pretty cool to see that in the modern era. Um, and yeah. and these units would have yeah. ventured all over the Penzi system, right? Yeah, they would have been from as far as now. They were they were they pretty much roam system wide, and they lasted through, through Penn Central and into the Conrail years, and some got some over some were painted blue. Ran, ran around Conroe Blue for a few years where they were finally sidelined. In fact, there's a museum back east whose name escapes me that uh, has a Conrail GP30 on display. In fact, our friend John Terry was over there, and I, there's a detail that was uh, on us in the museum. So I said, well, hey, if you're over there right now, could you shoot over there and uh, <laughs> get some shots of this detail for me? Yeah, sure, no problem, brother. And you know, so that was another another example of you know, a lot of other contacts and other people that we, that, we, uh, that, we, that we can turn to that can help us out on projects. You know, how it can come through in a pinch like that. So, I yeah. can't off the off the tip of my tongue. I can't think of the name of the museum, but uh, I've been there. I actually went there um, before the pandemic with Shane. We 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 went on kind of like the precursor of the road trip, mm -hmm. and uh, we got to go to that museum. It's right next door to Strasburg, and uh, it was pretty cool to see. So yeah, the the train phone antenna definitely makes those unique and. If I'm not mistaken, Paul, is this the first time that the train phone has been offered uh, in HO scale on a GP30? Um, I believe so. And I'm, oh, I'm looking at, I did some quick Google, that's the Strasburg Railroad Museum, I don't know if this is with my uh, searching script. But yeah, um, yeah, to answer the question, I believe this is the first time this has been done in plastic or on a GP30. I don't think any of the previous GP30 models have ever had that feature. So Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, that's what that's what they're saying okay. there in the comments. That's Strasburg, yeah. Okay. Because they're, okay. they're two separate uh, entities. Oh, and, 
Okay. I'll tell you the uh, that museum is incredible. If if you folks watching ever have never been there, I can't recommend it enough. Um, it is one of the most amazing museums I've ever been to. Everything is just in pristine condition. Um, it is it's a very interactive railroad museum. They have several displays that you can walk through. They even have a locomotive simulator, and uh, that GP thirty is gorgeous. And uh, myself being a a Norfolk Southern fan. Um, back before the 30th anniversary, NS did a, this was in 2012, but they actually ran the train, I think a year earlier, maybe two years earlier, but they had the NNW 522, which is a good segue because we're going to talk about the NNW uh, GP30 here in the next segment. They had NNW 522, um, the Conrail engine from, from that railroad museum of Pennsylvania, and then uh, a Southern Railway GP30. I can't remember if it was 2594. Um, from Southeastern, or if it was the one from NCTM, but they ran a photo train to celebrate the three big railroads, and that was a big deal before the Heritage Units came online. So GP30s, and I also thought that was kind of cool because they had GP30s, and it was Norfolk Southern's 30th anniversary. I always thought that was a really cool <laughs> photo shoot. So we're looking here at the at the actual photo of our model, um, the GP30s that we're doing in NW, we're offering them in Pevler Blue. And um, if you check out our Time to Model article that, that just came out this week, um, if you're not subscribed to the Scale Trains newsletter, highly recommend it. Every week we're putting out uh, great content, articles, and things like that to go along with you know pre order information and billing updates and things like that. So if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, you're missing out. But there's a great article uh, in the newsletter this week about NNW GP30s. I actually learned a lot. Um, these locomotives were painted, repainted actually in blue, and they were called Pevler Blue because of Herman Pevler, who was actually the former president of the Wabash Railroad. And when the NNW merger happened, where the NNW took over the Wabash and the nickel plate, uh, NNW inherited some nickel plate GP30s, but once once they started to take over that system, they began to repaint a lot of their locomotives. And the blue is actually kind of close to a Wabash blue. Um, I had a friend of mine, uh, I spoke with a friend of mine today, and he said, you know, Pebbler blue is really the last vestige of the Wabash, and it was being lived out through the NNW, which I thought was uh, really neat when you think about it. So, Paul, tell me about some of the unique features of the NNW GP30. Oh, nothing really unique about the N and W thirties. Um, well, except for that that big honking high nose. <laughs> <laughs> so, you got that. so that was a feature that um, N and W and Southern specified on their on their GP thirties, keeping in line with the the options they were specifying on the locomotives in that time frame. Um, I know, Drayton, and I remember you mentioned in, in previous time to, in previous calls. I think on the on the, the SD forty five in particular, why that these were specified the high nose. But um, yeah, the high short hood, the bell mounted on the on the end of the high short hood on N and W, as well as the split five chime horns they had early on that they were mounted that they had a two chime horn on the one side of the cab and then a three chime on the other side of the cab. And um, yeah, those were fairly unique features that the that no other GP thirties, well at least the most other GP thirties didn't have, at least as far as the high nose is concerned. And um, yeah, they, those were the. Those are definitely those are definitely unique units among the GP thirties with that with the high nose and another little interesting tidbit on the high nose units, the cab roof was different on the high nose compared to other ones like that this that brow sat a little further back on uh, on the cab roof compared to a standard um, low nose unit. Why I've never been able to find a reason explanation why, but that's just how reason why that's how EMD built them. Which is a little interesting. interesting uh, uh, one thing I was going to say about the NW units is they had dual controls mm -hmm. and not a whole lot of room in the cabs. And a lot of times the nickel plate guys and the Wabash guys really did not like running NW units because they, they had the dual control cabs in them. So you had less space in the, in the cab. And at that time you had, uh, in many cases, four and sometimes five man crews. So it was really cramped in that cab. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, low visibility, but another thing that made them unique is NNW actually designated them to be long hood forward, whereas Southern, Southern units had a uh, control stand, and it's kind of cool. You can actually see this in some videos of the, the Southern ones that are preserved, but the Southern control stand is actually angled a little differently than 
your standard uh, EMD control stand. And that's so that the engineer has a little bit of extra room to look over his shoulder when they're going long foot, long hood forward. Um, but the NNW, they chose to have their GP30s with dual control calves and long hood leads. So uh, I just want to show here a little bit of uh, the screen here that shows our time to model article. Um, this was done by Ed Painter, who is uh, one of our contributors. He actually um, has shared a lot of his photo collection with us. And as a result, we're able to use these photos for product development. Paul, how important is it for us to receive photos like this um, to work on projects like this? Oh, critical. Um, like I mentioned, uh, for, for things that may no longer be around, um, collections of people like Mr. Painter um, and other individuals that we work with are critical. Um, because it's, you know, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to differ, you know, denote, you know, the you know, catch little details like the horn placements or, you know, you know, rooftop shots in particular. Those are really important to us since most folks, a lot of folks like to take three quarter roster shots, which are nice for publications and they may be giving an overall feel of the unit, but um, be able to get up close and personal and or takes like rooftop shots or end shots, things that, you know, traditional railroad photographers may not take because it's not, you know, artsy. You know, that's the stuff we love. You know, if you want to get in there up close and personal, and, like take a shot of whatever, Air filter equipment is under the underframe or next to the air tank or a detail on the truck, truck side frame, you know, by all means, get in there close. I mean, that's what I do when I'm, you know, you know, when we're, we're at museums or documenting something rolling by on a real, real train these days, you know, it's definitely getting close and personal if you can, you know, zoom in there and you try to try to capture that detail. For sure. For sure. And uh, one last thing I wanted to say about the NNW units, um, this photo here that Tony's got is really, really cool. I love this photo. This looks like it was just outside of Cleveland, I think, Tony. You know, I was looking for that. I, we don't have, this is from Kevin U. Daly's collection, and I wondered that too, what the location was. It would be my layout if I won the lottery. Look at the multi-levels there. The That's nice cool. backdrop in the background. You've got, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that would be my railroad. I don't yeah, know where it's from. Cool. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to say, for a second I thought it was Chicago, and uh, Back in the 70s, NNW actually ran a commuter train that went outside the city into Indiana uh, on the former nickel plate. And I think it went to Valparaiso. I think that was the end of the line. And um, they had a several GP30s actually that they used to pull that train. And uh, they also had like a steam generator car that went along with it. But there, if you look, there are some pictures online. I can't think of that NNW train. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's some folks in the comments that will be able to tell us what train that was, but it, there was a commuter train that ran. So if you like passenger trains, NNW GP30s, you can also run a passenger train with your GP30s. You just got to have a steam generator equipped unit or another steam generator car to go with it. So pretty cool. Um, let's move on to our next road name now. Paul, we've had a lot of questions over this road name, <laughs> Rio Grande. And yeah. I think this would be a great place for you to address the features of the Rio Grande units. Okay. Um, to start well, to start off to kind of clear up any confusion, these units are configured basically toward the toward the latter part of the careers and like what like what I kind of call, refer to as the Anschutz era, which is you know late mid late eighties to the, into the early early mid nineties. Um, this is when Rio Grande and Southern Pacific were under the same uh, under the same corporate umbrella. So during that time frame, you saw a lot of GP thirties wandering around on the on the, you know that were re some had been sidelined, but they were reactivated, and you saw a lot of them operating on the Southern Pacific, which a lot of folks know is my favorite railroad. And and anyway, so my my, my experience with GP30s were seeing former Rio Grande units, you know, operating on the SP here in Southern California during the 90s when I was like when I was you know a young punk kid with my first camera out there rail fanning. And my first time I saw GP30, I was like, wow, that is a funky looking locomotive. You know, compared to all the tunnel motors and SD45s and G35s I, you know, used to see. And so anyway, these units are configured for that era. Um, as far as the, the horn types, some units will have a replacement Nathan P3 horn. Um, these have the later, the later um, Revo frogs that Rio Grande used. Some units um, have late, later, like more modern, modern style EMD snow plows that replace the original. Um, style that they had like that in the photo you see right there. That was the that was original original style of snowplow. These units were were retrofitted with after delivery. Um, you know, you know modernized cut levers with the with the loops on the corners for the switchman to grab onto. And, you know, so you, when he's standing the step well. 
And you know, radio, different radio antennas. Um, some units will have gyro lights in the nose versus the as delivered Mars brand lights, which are which have physical differences. You know, in addition to the light pattern that they threw. So these units are really, you know, really unique as far as how they're equipped, and they haven't no two are exactly alike. In fact, in this photo in 3015, you can see these air filter inspection ports that are on the that are on the inertia compartment behind the cab. Those four plated over discs or whatever you want to call them. Um, though that was a, a minor saying, go again, talking about through my friend John Terry, you, you, you did some looking into it. And apparently, they were um, um, they were sight glasses where you can look into the air filter section and just see how dirty or clean your air filter elements were. That's my I'm going from memory here, but that's what they were. That's a feature, feature you saw in some late, some real grand or real grand and other railroads GP 30s late in their lives, which also has never been done before in a scale model. So um, again, these are these are these are, these are how these units will look pretty late in the careers. But I have no fear. We did tool, and we will offer you know real grand GP thirties and more um, you know as delivered or seventies you know sixty seventies you know uh, configurations as well as we go down the go down the road with this model. So that's the exact road number there that uh, that we're offering. Really cool to see that prototype, uh, Tony, just jumping back and forth between the two. Um, Paul, I wanted to ask you too. So these are going to have class lights, and then the Mars uh, slash gyro light. Are the the patterns of the lights actually going to be uh, just like what you'd see on the prototype? Yeah. Um, thanks to our good friends at uh, ESU Log Sound, um, you know they've they've been able to program a very convincing gyro light effect as well as a Mars light effect. A gyro light light beam basically throws the it it um, runs the bulb in a kind of an oval pattern. And so you just have like a single, like a like a light, like a lens flare pop that, that hits you, hits you in the face of the engine that's coming at you. Versus a Mars light is a bit more complex. It kind of did a figure eight pattern, kind of danced around, and you kind of had a double flash effect as you know to kind of simulate the, how the light beam would hit your face in the prototype. And um, again, since obviously we can't replicate the little tiny electrical motor and mechanism in HL scale, the best we can do is kind of mimic that uh, that light beam effect as it hits you in the face. And I think you know then. Yes, he's done a fantastic job of replicating that, and, and so in addition to, to the to the either the Mars brand light housing on the nose or a light brand housing on the nose, they will be programmed with that correct light lighting effect out, you know, out of the box per per unit as you mean. And so you can go to scaletrains.com website, and we have all the production the product features listed, and also, and also the model features of every unit. So you can go to list and see which one is equipped as you know as for you know what type of lighting effect and whatever, and all the other little features they have that are different. So, Tony, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're a bit of a Rio Grande fan. Um, do you have any GP30 memories uh, that, that really stand out to you? Uh, I, I actually rode in a GM&O Jeep 30 when I was a little kid. But Rio Grande, I, I remember seeing them quite a bit. I think up on the Monarch branch where they uh, did limestone, that line's long gone now. I remember we followed a couple Jeep 30s down on the switchbacks with the little 40 foot gondolas of limestone stuff one time and shot like super eight of them. And that's kind of my memory of rear grand Jeep thirties for sure. Oh um, yeah. It's like, and for me, like the, like, like I mentioned, the first thirties I ever saw were real grand units. In fact, I first, first year that I ever saw was 3015 hmm. um, out here in Southern California. And this is after the, this is actually after the UPS merger. And it lasted a few years after the merger. I think it was, I think I shot it, shot it around 90, Seven or ninety-eight with the first camera I ever had, and I caught it on the Union Pacific on Pomona, California, wow. for working like a switch job, and it was, um, yeah, neat locomotive, neat looking locomotives, different, definitely different from everything else at the time. Yeah, for I sure. Uh, Rio Grande Jeep thirties. Also, the first time I saw one was like in eighty-one when um, a bunch of college friends uh, kidnapped this high school kid, me, <laughs> um, out on a uh, basically a transcon trip. It's basically a uh, a trip we just uh just drove around for uh, 10 days uh shooting trains all over the southwest we went out to the yeah. rio grande we camped out in utah right under castle gate at night and uh yeah we saw g30s yeah all over the railroad out there and then two years later they started pooling onto the esp they started coming out under the esp which was the coolest thing for uh for this young fan when when they came out on in northern california and california and uh yeah we chased these things they have those m3 horns and uh, they were yeah. so compared to uh, the, the P3s that we would normally yeah. There's some really cool pictures out there of, uh, of GP30s on Rio Grande. And 
There's one, and I haven't been able to find it. I tried to find it before we did the live stream, and uh, I, I wasn't able to locate it. But uh, there, the my favorite Rio Grande line is the uh, the. Some people call it the Moab branch, but it's actually called the Cane Creek subdivision. Um, runs just outside of Arches National Park down towards Moab. Um, and it goes through some of the most beautiful terrain that you've ever seen. And uh, it was actually, there was an article in Trains Magazine about five or six months ago, and they talk about this branch line. There's a really cool photo of two uh, grand GP30s. Oh, hey, let's go over to Paul's screen. He's, he's oh, I removed, I removed Paul. No. Yeah. Without him, hold on a second. Let me. There we go. Now we got it. There we go. Now you can see it. Um, this photo that I that I have is really cool. It's got a couple of Rio Grande GP30s coming around the bend um, with some of the arches in the background. But they're just iconic locomotives, and um, that's definitely one of the road names that we've heard the most hype from. So. Uh, moving along from Rio Grande, um, we're going to take a look at Chicago Northwestern. Um, these units are, I believe, the only non-dynamic brake units that we're offering in this run, if I'm not mistaken, Paul. Yeah. And uh, one of the, we're, we're offering them in two different paint scheme variations, the, the OY scheme and then the modified OY scheme. You want to share a little bit about the paint scheme variations, Paul? Yeah, um, you know this is the, the you know the the classic C and W O you know OI or you know or um, original yellow scheme or stagecoach yellow scheme as some fans call it, um, and um, we had photographs of one of the units in that scheme that it looked, looked like it was repainted fairly on that uh, they when they repainted they added a little bit more green to it in certain areas. Yeah, there you go in that shot right there. In fact, they got the sample model right here. It, um, it as as you typically see when some when railroads maybe paint something or contract shops they may deviate a little bit from the uh, normal paint paint specifications. So this unit got just a bit of extra green along the blower the walkway blower walkway duct on both sides. So it makes the stand out just a little bit a little bit compared to the standard um, you know EMD spec the original paint job that these units would have had. Here's a photo from Tony. Beautiful, beautiful photo. Yeah, gorgeous shot. Yeah, I love so, that old, old yellow paint scheme. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, Paul, is the – let me go back to my other screen here just so I can – just one second. I got 15 screens open. It's hard to keep track of all of them. No no pun intended. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Let me swap back over to my screen. So uh, photos from Model Railroad News. Shout out to Tony. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about these to me, and I had never noticed this until these, until I saw these photos, because we actually didn't get to see the production samples in Tennessee before the show. So it wasn't until I saw these photos and I noticed these, these three or four, maybe five lines on the cab roof. And I've noticed some of the GP 30s that, that we're offering have these lines and some of them don't. And this photo, it's the best one that I could find at the moment. Um, it's a little out of focus on the 812, but what what are those lines? Well, if, well like like typical, a lot of other EMD production, I believe, I guess they're, forgive me if I get the technical term incorrect, but I've, uh, but for simplified terms, it's like there are like lap joints or weld seam joints and where they were assembling the cab structure. And on the 30, there's been at least four or five roughly different patterns I've noticed, um, you know, as far as those, as far as those roof seams go, like on the, C and W mentioned you had the the like it was like the you know like the like four four or five um, seam or um, joints that that ran the length that ran the length of the cab roof. Um, you had some units that just had a single single seam that ran the out on the center line of the cab roof, and they had a little cross seam on the toward the front of the cab roof where the uh, that triangle section where the uh, where the where the you know, the cab roof comes to a point. And there were a couple other variations on that, and again, it um, that seemed to vary on that vary depending on when the unit was built, as far as we can tell from photographs. You know, and if so, I'm not mistaken, that's the first time that's ever been done in HO scale. That's correct. I know previous models, high-end GP their models, I just I think they just settled on one particular variation. But from going through photographs and research and realizing, you know, hey, there's a lot of uh, a lot of cab roof variations on these, so we decided to try to capture them exactly as we could based on the photographs. In fact, on this particular one, like on the GP30, we're showing with the what the what the five joints were in the length of the cab roof. 
um, in our collection, we had a really good shot. And I'm unfortunate, unfortunate, it was an unfortunate circumstance, but it was a shot of a uh, Santa Fe GP30 that had been in a wreck and it rolled on its side. And the front part of the roof, roof cabin was, was caved in. And it was just a perfect shot showing you know, that pattern and that, of, that, of, the, the, of those joints in the cabin with that, from that particular phase of GP30. So, you know, it took a lot of overhead shots, like I said, which are, also, which are really critical. A lot of overhead shots that kind of determine the different rooftop, you know, lap joint, those seam patterns that you found, that you found in the GP30s, make sure we can try to include those as we can, you know, as we can, exactly as we can on the model. I didn't so, know that. Harry, did you know that? I didn't know Jeep 30s. Yeah, well. I, um, yeah I, I, that came across uh, when Paul and I talked about a month ago yeah. about this. I was like, hey, what's the deal with these seams up there? Yeah. You know? And I was wow. like, I never noticed that. And I like, had yeah. never either. Yeah, and those pictures, actually, those are not me. That is, I, I think that's Otto Vondruck was at yeah. Amherst. Yeah, pretty sure it's Otto. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's, that's, uh, I, that's the neatest thing about when these models come out and you start doing the research or you're seeing these pictures – and when we look at some of the slides I've got, I've got some questions for Paul of, hey, what's that? Or what I noticed this for the first time in digging through them. And that's always fun. But wow, that's a takeaway here. I I didn't know that the yeah, we're, we're flying. I, I really like this next level detail stuff. Yeah. Because it's, it's not something that you could pull off a peg at a hobby shop and stick on your locomotive necessarily. It's, right. it's just got to be there to begin with, you know? Yeah, got to be baked in. Oh, that's a neat shot. Ooh. I like that. That's a nice photo. ATS. Yeah, the pickup shoe. That's that's really that's cool. And now you guys are going to have the lights over the trucks, and then I noticed the lights back on the blower housing. I mean, what are some of the above? And the class lights will work. What are we looking at light wise? We talked about the gyro lights, like on the Rio Grands, <laughs> but what features will? And I assume this will be across all of them. Yeah, um, as you know, as well uh, from pretty much. Pretty much most GP third, most if not all GP GP thirties as delivered, will they're going to have the the ground light or truck light AC in this photo above the above the truck on both sides, um, you know, to help illuminate the ground so the engineer or conductor can look down and just see it you know, at night to see if they're you know to kind of see if they're moving or not. Um, you're also going to have the operating walkway lights. Um, that's a feature we introduced on the Dash Nine, if I remember correctly. Um, the GP thirties will have that on both ends, but uh, well, on the end of the long hood, end of the short hood front. And also um, the little light that's built into the side of side of the long hood, right at the where the step up is at the at the walkway walkway duct. So those will be all illuminated. Um, class lights or marker lights per product. Those will operate either you know the tricolor class lights or the single color red marker light like you would have seen on Henzi and PC and Conrail, as well as we'll also have operating beacons. You know either like the federal standard type rotating gumball machine beacon or more latter-day strata lights depending on the road name um and also ditch lights is appropriate like i know we've we've we're, we've uh as we teased at amherst we'll be offering at some point um some more latter-day rebuilds like including the bngb 39es which are which i'm really excited for those are really neat looking units and when they were first out shop from emd they would have had the um i think they were quantum brand these these square strobe light houses on the walkway mm -hmm. And then they flash from the horn as well, like a kind of like a xenon strobe effect. And they later got re replaced with ditch lights at some you know later in their since it was, you know, as ditch lights became the became the vogue at the time in the in the nineties. Um so yeah, lots of lighting and animation is appropriate for different road names. You know, this is kind of continuing on what we've what we've been doing, you know, you know, like we're gonna start with doing the uh on the uh, super turbines, you know, with all the lighting and animation features where we try to incorporate as much as that as possible we're going along here with, with new locomotives and new releases, trying to you know, trying to trying to break new ground and you know raise the bar, so to speak. I thought the the SDL thirty nines were fantastic with some yeah. of that light stuff. Absolutely grabbed me looking at the different things that they had. Like, wow, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Our Charles Myler, our developer on that project, he did a an outstanding job as far as you know, specking the a lot of the features on the model and you know trying to ex you know, make sure they were executed properly. And I think the folks will be really really pleased when the models hit here pretty shortly, if I remember correctly. I think they're due in. I think they do here stateside. They should be here now, or if not very soon. Oh my! Yeah, we got a couple more weeks um, until they're oh. here. Um, the Dash Nines are going to build uh, first, and um, <clears throat> they'll be building, I think, next week. But uh, SDL thirty nine should be here very, very soon. So, yeah. and I can tell you right now, they, the lighting features on them are just incredible. Um, you know, again, the original tagline of, of that we used when we launched the company was innovative scale trains and the lighting effects that you're going to see on these models and the, the 
uh, squeal from going around curves and, and frog clank noise. Yeah. It's it's really incredible. So hey, I just want to give a shout out to uh, to Shane uh, Shane Wilson. He's uh, watching from <laughs> Daytona. Um, Shane's out on the scale trains road trip, and um, he's actually in the comment section right now answering some comments. So Shane, thanks for tuning in. Glad you like my hat. Um, uh, as some some of you guys might not have heard, but uh, we re recently just uh, launched uh, scale trains apparel. We've got hats and shirts and things like that. So you can run your model trains and, uh, and show uh, your scale train support while you're doing it. So um, yeah, pretty cool. So Shane, uh, safe travels out there. Hope you're having fun on the road. Uh, some exciting new um, stops that we've got coming up on the scale trains road trip. And also want to give a shout out to, to Harry and Tony and all of our other uh, road trip sponsors um, who, who cover us on the road. We really appreciate what you guys do. And, and also just with product announcements, you guys really go above and beyond um, to help us share the news about product announcements and things like that. So we really appreciate all the, all the hard work that you guys do to, to share what we're up to. Hey, we don't mind spreading the good news. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's great stuff when uh, you guys, that you guys turn out and we're happy to tell people about it. You know, it's, it's awesome. Good I see an SDL 39 on, uh, on that uh, Monterero <laughs> News Magazine back there. Oh, he's already. <laughs> that, that was my good fortune at Christmas. You guys let me have the samples for a couple of days as they went on to your photographer. So that is the, I got to see them all. And wow. That equal was time, cool. equal time. <laughs> very very hey, nice. We can definitely talk about something like that. Here. All right. We'll talk later, Drayton. <laughs> Get well, Harry, hey, make sure Harry gets all the two thirty like that. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll make that it happen. Cool. We'll make it happen. That was a fantastic issue, right. by the way. I, I really enjoyed looking at it. And uh, Milwaukee Road SD forty dash two is in there too. And oh, which, yeah. by the way, for those watching, we do have a few Milwaukee Road SD forty dash two still in stock. So Ooh. you don't want to miss out on those. There's only uh, there's just a handful of them left. So if you want them, uh, you better go to our website and get them now. So. We got one more road name to talk about, guys, and this one is my personal favorite out of all of them that we've announced in this run. It's actually not even a GP30. It's a slug unit. So we're going to take a look. Here's a picture of the model itself, a CSX Roadmate slug. Paul, this is a truly a revolutionary model. I, I actually bought a kit-bashed uh, slug set from a friend of mine about – two years ago and I never ever ever thought that there would ever be a manufacturer to offer one in HO scale and here we are offering one so tell me about the challenges behind offering a GP30 slug unit in HO scale well you know it's one of those things is like um, you know when, when we sit down and work start a project I'm one of those guys I like oddballs and variations on things I know, like at our previous employer, we did a we included a GP forty P dash two as part of a you know a, Jeep, a series of BMD Jeeps from that vintage, and you know looking at the GP thirty, you know it's like, okay, you know hey we got we can do you know GP thirty ninety E's from you know the, for BN which had the you know the rebuilt you know, front end with the new cab and nose and, and a sub base assembly, um, Santa Fe GP thirty U's with the flattened cab front, and you know I'm sort of looking it's like you know. How about a CSX GP30 Road Slug? I mean, that's unique. They lasted for a long time. Um, there's obviously there are obviously going to be some expensive, obviously you know the the new the new car body I mean, without all the doors with all the doors removed and all the fans and those played off. That's a lot of new side slides and inserts and other parts. But you know we have, we've never shied away from stuff like that before. So you know why not include it? And um, I think I think we are the very first people to offer. You know, a road, a, a slug in general, a mass-produced plastic, which I think is a is a unique uh, unique accomplishment. So, yeah, between these and the UP GP thirty B the units, which never been offered before, um, you know, we wanted to try to break some new ground with the GP thirty. You know, not just another GP thirty. You know, okay, people say, yeah, thirties have been done before. You know, big deal, but never the road slugs, never a GP thirty B unit. And so, this is a way to kind of set ourselves away from the rest of the pack. You know, with, with unique models that uh, no one's ever done before, with a level of detail no one's ever seen before. So, and and Paul, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there's never been a CSX GP30 slug in brass either. I, I scoured the internet the other day uh, because I, I'm 
like like you said, we are the first to ever offer it uh, in HO scale. So, and honestly, I think the first to offer it in any scale, which is pretty incredible. And again, it just kind of goes back to being innovative. And, and that's what Scale Trains is all about. Tony, this photo, I love this photo. I've seen it before. I don't know where I've seen it, but I've seen it before. A um, shot is kind of cool. That is so cool. That is so cool. Ex Tony, explain what we're looking at. Uh, I think I ran that in the announcement in Model Railroad News is where you might have seen it. But yeah, okay. and, and my caption says, not the first unit, but look <laughs> at the second unit because they're going to do that. I remember when those first hit, they literally looked like models that the guy didn't finish. Like, well, look at that. He did a Jeep 30. He didn't put girls or fans on the back of it. It's like it's a semi-done model. But yeah, this is, and what they ran in coal service, what's the prototype? history on these paul because i other than seeing them a few times i don't know anything about them. um from talking to my friend brian and nick i believe uh, just locals heavy just heavy uh, heavy locals i think possibly cold search i'm not positive you know csx operations are a little bit out of my out of my scope of you know interest to you know as far as what i you know what you can quote me on but um typical road slug duty where you have you know heavy tonnage you know and you know with and you know basically you needed to get more, get as much oomph as you could from, you know, as far as, from, you know, from all your axles to give you that uh, attractive effort punch to get that train moving and keep it moving. You know, when speed's not a factor, you know, a slug is your your best way to, best way to go. And um, I can speak to it a little bit, but the there's a really great video on YouTube, and somebody pirated it, but it's on YouTube. I I, I don't know why they haven't gone after him for putting it up on uh, on YouTube, but. Pentrax did an incredible video called Eastern Kentucky Coal. And in that video, it's early 90s, I want to say like 92, 93. So a lot of these slugs had just been rebuilt at Huntington Shops in West Virginia. And the reason they used them on coal trains, and there's GP35 slugs in this video as well. Like Paul was saying, they're really ideal. Road slugs are ideal for slow drag service. Because like, for instance, if you're at a, a coal loadout facility, you've got a 100 car long train anywhere between 10 to 14,000 tons of coal behind you. And these slugs help the, the GP40s have better tractive effort. So you can go really, really slow. And I know on Norfolk Southern, I can't totally speak to CSX, but the NS road slugs, they kick out at, uh, I believe, 20 miles an hour. And then it goes back to just using the mother unit, um, the traction motors on the mother unit, because once the power curve reaches a certain point, it's not as beneficial at higher speeds to use a slug, but CSX right. found great use with these slugs on coal trains in the nineties. And uh, over time, as they got older, they started to be used more and more in local service. And, you know, CSX had a ton of GP forties from, from the B and O and the C and O and Chessy and the whole nine yards, they had a ton of GP forties. And so for CSX, this was a way to make their GP forties more useful and it was a way for them to actually get use out of the GP30s because, um, you know, Paul and I have, have discussed things back and forth about the GP30, and I've learned a lot from Paul. But one of the things I really learned from Paul was about the electrical nightmare that the GP30s were. And uh, CSX had to deal with a lot of these problems. And as these locomotives were approaching the 20, 25-year mark, rebuilding them was the next step. Uh, and CSX, instead of keeping them power, decided to make them slugs, So, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. And that kind of leads me into the next part of what I wanted to talk about. And also into our Q&A session. Uh, one thing be be before we move on from the CSX slugs, though, I noticed uh, there was a comment in here from, uh, let me scroll back up. There was a guy, uh, Amtrak and Southern Pacific Rail fan said, uh, Fix the CSX slugs. I've seen the CSX community try to reach out to help you address the problems. Your models have, but you've completely ghosted them. Bad move, scale trains. Well, uh, just so you know, we did see uh, in the CSX modelers group and also the scale trains modelers group on Facebook, uh, there was someone who shared some photos of the deco samples. And they pointed out some things that between the prototype and uh, the deco sample that we had that weren't 100% correct. Um, just so you know, if you guys contact us through sales at scaletrains.com, um, we get all of your information. And the best thing to do to help us, um, if there's an issue with one of our deco samples, if you see something, tell us about it. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, like 
Paul, for instance, he just said, you know, CSX operations are a little bit out of his realm. Well, I know a little bit more about CSX than Paul because that's the railroad that I grew up with. Paul, he knows everything that you could ever want to know about Southern Pacific. So no, not quite, but <laughs> he knows a lot. And so we, we try to help each other, um, you know, when, when there's a knowledge gap, but we don't know everything. And we'll be the first to, to tell you that without photos, um, without the information that you guys provide us, it's really hard to, to get everything that we need to make accurate models. And we do our very best. Every now and then we'll make a mistake. So on those deco samples, just know that they are deco samples. They're not production samples. And the reason why we have deco samples made is, yes, so we can have pretty pictures to promote the models when we announce them, but also so that our product development team can look them over, compare them to photos, compare them to blueprints and things like that. So um, just to address the CSX issue head on, we're aware of these issues that you've mentioned. There were some slight issues uh, about vents and doors and things like that and MU cables. Uh, we're aware of them. The best thing to do to help us with that is to supply uh, the information to sales at scaletrains.com and, and also include prototype photos because, you know, if you tell us something, but we don't see it in a photo, uh, we're probably not going to offer it in a model. We have to have photo documentation. Uh, and it also can't be a 12 kilobyte photo that you found off of Railroad Pictures archives. We got to be able to see what you're talking about. So uh, if you've got any issues uh, that you see on any of our GP30s, not just the CSX slugs, email us sales at scaletrains.com. Any and all things that you guys have for us, that would be great. So moving on from the CSX issue, Paul, real quick, let's talk about future versions. So what are some of the future versions that we're considering looking at? Um, like I mentioned earlier, we got the like Santa Fe GP30Us. <clears throat> that'll be coming at some point um those are unique and sad and a lot of them a lot of them units when they were rebuilt they had the that v-shaped windshield that was so unique so unique to the gp30 originally we put into a more conventional flat front windshield which is unique to the 30 U's. um what else the bn gp 390 rebuilds which i think are some of the most distinctive ones out there so say um bn needed some medium horsepower units uh, okay there's a santa fe gp30u example yeah, but as far as as far as BN went, they needed they needed more medium horsepower units, so they contracted with um, EMD VMV Enterprises and Morrison Newton to have secondhand GP30s rebuilt to modern day specifications. And the most unique of the bunch of the ones that a group of former, I think about ten former Southern units that BN had rebuilt by EMD. And as a part of the process, they had the entire front end removed, you know, the, the cab nose and sub base, and replaced with a more conventional. AMD Spartan style cab, but that was you know that we'd have seen it you know in use of the time like an SD forty dash twos and so forth, and those were probably some of the neatest ones out there, and those will be seen in future releases. Um, BNO and chassis and GP thirty M rebuilds, which had some subtle differences here and there depending on the units. Like some some units had the steps, the corner the step hole steps relocated, lowered a little bit, and kind of the spacing rearranged, as well as the mail slot battery box openings. Um, along with some other things, and also going to be able, also also to do in that attractive chassis chesty system paint job. So there's a lot of different possibilities that we'll be able to do down the line, both as far as additional road names, or there you go, or as or as um, you know, additional road names and or new paint schemes. Like I said, like I said, chassis system will be definitely included in a future run. Um, you know the BN rebuilds. You know the you know those you know again they you go the BNSF you know BNSF um, repainted rebuilds. And you know the 30 is one of those locomotives that just has a lot of um, possibilities. You know we can't do them all, can't do them all unfortunately right out of the gate, but we'll do as much as we can as we go along with the project. You know, and there's a lot to a lot to cover with this locomotive. I mean, for it's uh, you know from 1962 or 61 for the from the pre-production units, you know, all the way through till now, there's there, there's a GP30 out there in some fashion for a lot from for most railroads, which is pretty new. So. A lot of ground to cover, and I'm pretty excited to see what this what this project leads to in the future. Absolutely. So uh, let's open up the Q and A session, and I want to start out with uh, with with Harry and Tony before we jump to the viewer questions. You guys have any questions for Paul uh, as the product developer? Anything that you want to know further about the GP30? I think hey, Harry, you, you, oh, you, Tony, go ahead. You've got some pictures, and I've got some stuff too. That maybe as we're doing the question and answer. We can go through some of these other G30s and ask all some various things. Uh, what I did was put together 
just some various shots with some some general questions on phases and different production <laughs> things like Redding was the first railroad to get Jeep 30s and this is brand new 1962 Man. but yeah isn't that sharp that's beautiful but, uh, yeah one of the things I caught in looking this is later on and that hatch in the back I looked across from the old Atherin blue box to the Lionel others I, and not all of them have it. That looks like a, is that a SAN or MU? What is that hatch below the number board there? Sandfill hatch. Um, yeah. for, that's a, early production had the sand filler, you know, it's similar to the style you'd have seen on, on an E or an F unit mounted low. Um, it was mounted low on the car body right there under the, under the number board housing on the, you know, on the engineer's side of the long hood. And later production, they moved it up onto the, onto the top of the long hood point, you know, where the, where it would typically reside, you know, and both get both in early. So it went from that, that, that pull out drawer type door to a, um, a, a square sand filler hatch is mounted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The last shot. Oh, should have yeah, and I've got them around like there. It looks like it's still on that one, but mm -hmm. it's, I guess it's up top there. Yeah. That's later production where they moved it up top. Like later okay. production, say they had the sand filler moved up top, moved up to the top of the long hit point right there. And uh, uh, later yeah. production, late, late, late production, I think for, L and N and Southern, they actually went to a round style sand filler hatch that you would have seen. That was the late style you would have seen on things like GP forties, GP forty dash twos, SD forties, that kind of stuff. So and there it is. I see yeah, that. Yeah, there it is. You can see that shot. It's open. It looks like. Yeah, isn't that neat? And yeah. I noticed uh, I hadn't realized, but you know, hit and miss. There's polling pockets there on the pilot yeah. steps of these Burlington ones, which is. Yeah is and isn't one thing i heard and i don't i couldn't find pictures to support it but see the plate that the dynamic brake fan sits in in that indention area mm -hmm. i've heard there's multiple levels or like some of them are stacked higher or there's not a plate is that see how that obviously looks like it's on a squared plate and then the fan sits on it right yeah there's a there's a at least from photos, it looks like at least, at least at least on this first initial run and just some photos in general that we've gone through, that appears to be a pretty standard feature on all G30s across. Like they like a like that the fan was sat on, on a square plate, and on some roads, like on like on some roads like Union Pacific, for example, if I can grab one here, the fan itself actually sat on a riser. I mean, I'm losing light here quickly in the West Coast, but yeah. um, yeah, let me get from the camera. The fan itself sat on a riser ring that made it sit a little higher compared to everything else. And in fact, you okay, sit that's what I heard. That's yeah. what I heard. Yeah, that there's variations that's, there. So you guys are catching or are, are going to have that. Wow, that's mm -hmm. very cool. Yeah, that's a lot like uh, what EMD did later on cheap 40 dash twos and stuff, um, you know, where the fan's sitting on a riser as well. So it, yeah. it kind of carried through, but it disappeared on those rigs straight cheap 40. All straight cheap 40s had it low you know, yeah. or, or conventionally. Cool deal. That's a beautiful photo too. And oh. if you notice there, they've got they've got sort of like a I guess an emergency light there on the nose. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, cool. yeah, Great Western had kind of that same light package as Rio Grande. And they oh, well, no, the Rio Grande's not an emergency light though, but it's that same details west part or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah it's it's now yeah. these are the these are odd ducks, and this is one I, again. A couple of things I'm going to show are questions I've already had of. And there's only two, if I remember right. And the, on the right, in the as delivered, is the maroon scheme. And I think they are EMD. They're not GMD. But boy, here's a challenge for you. Look at the pilot steps. Look at that kind of odd pilot thing. The light or the bell up where the light would be. And these are there are only two GP30s to Canada and none to Mexico and none to export as far as I know. And then also, if you see the maroon shot, there's that's 8201, 8200 is coupled to it. And look at its rear light package mm -hmm. has lights oriented up towards the top instead of between the number boards. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very squirrely Jeep 30s, two of them only for Canada. Yeah. But if, if memory, if I remember, I think those were, I think those were built by GMD. If Are they GMDs? Okay. I yeah. want to say they were. But the, oh, the Mona with the, uh, or is that a nickel plate? Excuse me. That's uh, nickel, plate. nickel plate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the 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 other tough one there, putting the bell in the. I mean, some of these railroads are just out to get you, Paul. I mean, look at the tool yeah. you have to do to pull that off. <laughs> yeah. That that notch nose bell, that horizontal yeah. headlight, and then you also have the. Uh, they had a smaller fuel tank too. If memory serves me. Yeah, uh, they did. 
and yeah, I've got, I have that question coming up in, I think I have a TPNW to ask you on. And of course the rear grands. Yep. <laughs> I'm not thrilled that we're doing the late ones. It's fine. I know that you are going to get to these. There they are as delivered. And I have no idea what that train is. Wow. Four Jeep thirties, a steam it's generator. It's got to be a charter or something. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, it, that's 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 like 64, and that's about to go into the East Portal. But wow, these are wow. chronological through the Jeep 30s. You knew we we're going to talk about Rio Grande with me showing pictures. So here's the Rio Grande portion of the show. The yeah. early stuff with the odd. Now these came without snow plows, isn't that right? And Rio Grande right. added them. Right, right. Yeah, the snow plows are a retrofit item. In fact, they as built, they would have had the, the footboard assembly, and they had this weird. Don't know what it's called. I mean, I've looked through EMD service manuals. It's it, they called it some kind of pilot plow part, but it was basically this pointed. Oh, that pointed plow, thing, yeah, yeah. Kind of little pointy plow thing that's set between the set between the the, the MU hose catch I, catch boxes, and it was kind I of. I can't easy. remember. I think that Great Western one might have that. I might go back to it. And on these billboards, you're doing too. And I think is that it? In the 30s and 35s, they all came delivered with small flying, mm -hmm. and there was only a few that Rio Grande repainted. Yeah, only a handful of things. I think that there might been only two on the or two or three on the bill on the large billboard on the 30. Yeah, not very many. Yeah, uh, stray pack set of books. There's those three soft cover books on rear grand diesels. If you're any kind of rear grand fan, you got it. I, in fact, I have double copies on all of them. So that way, when I when I misplace one, there still is one sitting on the shelf for me. <laughs> um, and yeah, this is all the way down. This is Kenoki in the '80s. That's one of the Conrail Jeep 40s that Rio Grande bought. Yeah, those are the greatest. Yeah, yeah. And so that's mid '80s, nice. and then. That's this bandit. shot is Pueblo. Again, this is almost 1990. One of the bandit sues there, which mm -hmm. is interesting. And there you can see that hatch on the back for the sand filler below the right side number board. Yep. The, the one thing you're going to have to do on these, though, to make them right, Paul, the access <laughs> doors on the nose, you're going to have to flip around your tampon yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's amazing. I, and I can't remember. Yeah. It, it just oh, happened. Yeah. It, you notice that the structure yeah. gets reversed. And I see that all over on rear grand units that they would flip those. I guess that door just comes off. Yeah, it was weird. It's, it's not a hinge. From what I've okay. seen, it was, um, in fact, I think the last the last order of, of units that built they're built for Southern actually had hinged doors, but they hinged on the bottom. But uh, all previous sheet thirty production from at least from photos of it, that that door was just a standalone part that is latched and locked into place. And, and if you want to latch it off and rotate it, stick it on there upside down, then. Uh, the mess of people lines with the upside down striping and the the trucks on all these these were like ft trade-ins i think so you got the box and slope journals and you guys mm -hmm. are doing all that in fact this i think is everything is there a high yeah, roller yeah. bearing up front then there's a box a slope and a box yeah this one's got the mixed uh you know the, the, the order the combo package on the journals yeah this one's no. got the, and and these last are surprisingly late i mean i as far as I know, I mean, I assume most low, most you know, SP in particular, you know, they they pretty much standardize on that uh, Hyatt type, you know, roller bearing, you know, you know, housing on the on their um, for their journals on most stuff. But the Rio Grande units, a lot of Rio Grande stuff, still kept you know those original squared or smoked journals well, well into the nineties. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, broke to fix it. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. There's a nice roof shot to show you yeah. again. I'm trying to figure out on the dynamic brake fan how mm. that was set up or now here's the one you got to do for me paul and there's just one of these <laughs> oh run oh the movie stars yeah. I've got, and this is the one i think this is the unity of this or the 40 one of them is at the colorado rare museum and i i'm going to start the fun me thing so they paint it sierra pacific so it looks like that <laughs> this, is, this is you know one they did three units this is a 1973 <laughs> abc tv movie about the ski train they don't call it the ski train but the train coming down from Winter Park, the brakes freeze up, and the, it's a runaway down to, they call it Jackson City instead of Denver. And they repainted a 30, a 35, and then they did a horrible silver paint job. It's the rescue unit. The Jeep 40 comes up and hooks to the back of the train, brings it to a stop, which, of course, would work. You'd never pull the coupler out of one of those old, you know, heavyweight cars by putting oh, the brakes yeah. on a runaway train. I mean, this would work. I'm sure it would. So <laughs> anyway, this Sierra Pacific is, that's my request for the Jeep 30 you got to do. Then for Drayton, you oh, got no, no. high hood from the Fugitive. The LA yes. <laughs> yes. So I was I'm just going to say that. Hey, listen, and I want a Tommy, 
I want a Tommy Lee Jones and a Harrison Ford figure to go Ooh, with it. See, <laughs> I'm, I'm not there. Oh, and how'd that get in here? Paul, when are you oh. going to do the museum quality of this? Here it is. It's a box. There you go. It's yeah. a box. I know. The crap. You, you put all three of them and do the dinometer car. Oh. So it's a beautiful museum package. And anyway, I don't know how that picture got in there. Yeah. Obviously, uh, we, can, we can vouch for that. Here's another non-dynamic. I assume you'll get to at some point. Winterization hatch and Alco trucks were what on GMO, Milwaukee, Sioux, and maybe TP and W. Um, not the TP. Not the, well, no, not the TP. But GMO had them. Milwaukee had them, and Sioux had them with yep. the type. I say Alco trucks, AAR type B trucks. Yeah, and I think that messes with the fuel tank size. You can yeah. only get so big a fuel tank because they're yeah, it's like their AAR truck. I think they, I think they ordered those. I think if I'm very sure Harry, if Harry can jump in as well, but I believe they ordered those so they could have that more robust GE 752 traction motor. Yeah, yeah. people yeah, love the 752 because the yeah. MD electricals were a pretty big question mark right about that time. Yeah, so you had the, MD was putting a lot of horsepower through uh, questionable electricals for the 30s and 35s. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not like that reputation for being quote unquote bell ringers because yeah. the alarm bells would go off whenever you'd stress these guys a little bit too much, and uh, yeah. that's why Santa Fe spent the time to go rebuild them all. Yeah, you know, Santa Fe did that went to the went to that effort. Then you had BM with that rebuild program, yeah. and then you also had the. But curiously, the Rio Grande got away with it. So go figure, huh? So yeah, hey. Rio Grande took better care of their power, but for whatever reason, they lasted for a long, long time. And Paul, since, really, since we're talking oh, about, oh, there so, you go. Oh, look at that light package. See, wow. Wow. Whoa. That's, that's the one that you showed that was wrecked. Uh, since we were talking about SP and funky lights, how about that, Paul? <laughs> Let's put a gyro light on the top by the sand filter. Yeah, that is nice. Wow. I'll take, I'll take two. I want the as oh, delivered and I, I want the post wreck version. Yeah. <laughs> That was actually taken, I believe, at the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad shop. And uh, uh, they actually, so for those who don't know, The Fugitive was the first movie in the Hollywood movie industry that they actually used one-to-one -one scale trains in. And so they went in and they bought an n GP30, and I think they bought some GE. And yep. <laughs> I don't know why, like, you have to think about it. Like, they took this locomotive, shopped it, and they and they put the headlight like i mean that's a lot of work to do what they did and why they did it i don't know but uh oh, wow. that's an actual that's real that is a real photo of former nw 536 so i just had to show that photo I, you beat me to it tony uh, that's but awesome. that, that made my day I, I you there. yeah yeah and paul i can't believe come on sp you're not <laughs> doing sp in the first run i know you're yeah, holding out on that? your work but when I saw a Jeep 30 announcement, I'm like, okay, I'm going to CSX, Pensy, Rio mm -hmm. Grande. It's like, where's where's the Southern Pacific? SP will come. They know SPs were too, SP well, and Cottonmouth were tooled up. And interestingly enough, SPs and Cottonmouth tunes have subtle differences between the two. Um, the drop steps, drop step heights are different, and cotton belts had this inching little walkway fillet in the corners, the corners of the step wells to give you a little more toe room <clears> when you're going around the sides of the, uh, the long, uh, sides of the nose. Yeah. Um, They'll happen, but the weird thing about SP and Cotton Belt, you know, for you know, for being big Western railroads, they barely dipped their toe in the Jeep. Yeah, they didn't buy many. Yeah, they didn't they have did many between the, between the two of them, between SP and Cotton Belt, they didn't really last that long. They, um, I know SP looked at rebuilding one, and they set one aside at um, Sacramento to be rebuilt, but um, it just sat, and you know, the SP guys are like, oh, this thing is just too much of an oddball to try to rebuild. It's not a big fleet, and so they just kind of. Shined on the program, and that was the end of it by 86, 86 or so. Yep. Yeah. Oh man, Tony, you got the TP and W unit up. Yeah. You knew okay. that would come next. I mean, Rear Grand's <laughs> class one, and then yeah, here's TP and W. Here's that question on fuel tanks. Oh, yeah, that wow. has to be the dinkiest of all fuel tanks for a GP30. <laughs> I don't know how many gallons that is, but are there what about three sizes? Do you know offhand? Uh, how the... Two or three at least. Yeah, but they, as I know, you had the nickel plate you have the tp and w and also units with the aar trucks or the you know what the the, the, the which shortened the fuel tank out in a out yeah. of space experience but yeah 
Okay, so the TPMP, if I'm not mistaken, they only what? had one GP30 and it wore like 15 different paint schemes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like this is not as delivered. <laughs> it, it came in the scheme, that third unit with the more green to the look. It came in that scheme. And then they started to repaint it in the late 60s into their orange. And you can see some of the orange on that front handrail. They ran out of paint, but they still had this old like, <laughs> and green. So it got the white instead of the light, like chartreuse light green color striping. So it got this odd mix of, well, that's a striping for orange, but we ran out of orange. So we ended up painting it back into that Pullman green. Uh, then it was the only bicentennial Jeep 30 in the nation. For a while and that was what this is what's when i was a little kid i was about 10 years old in 76 this is what weekends were dad would take me up to like springfield illinois uh peoria we'd go up to chillicothe to see the santa fe so this is what saturday looked like was watching the tpw trains and then oh late my 70s, goodness this is a beauty so late, late 70s this got painted when the nickel plate berkshire was working and we just happened to be up there didn't know we were up rail fanning that day and boom this is was there so yeah drayton That's can you name, can you name any of those cars can you name the cars in the background there car spotting uh, it's hard for me to make out i can't really see is that a that's a mount something rather uh, i think the pickup truck is a chevy love pickup yep, l-u-v yep. oh mount. you're asking me about the guys car. i'm not so sure yeah. I thought you were asking me about that Pullman. Oh, no, 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 no. The <laughs> automobiles. The automobiles, if you can spot oh. your car. Ford I don't know, LTD. but that one there by the, the GP30 looks like it could have been in Miami Vice. Well, that's a classic. Yeah. yeah, Ford LTD, then the first yep. downsized Chevy Impala of the mid-70s. Harry, right on the money, love truck, one of the first Japanese yeah. trucks sold. And then I think that's a poor old AMC, like Concord yes. or something. I think you're spirit. right on it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Chevy uh, pickup was a uh, Isuzu, I think that they oh, was it? oh, yeah, classic. Yeah. And then oh, there is when the TPW took over the Santa Fe in the early '80s for a while. This is them at Argentina. <laughs> Actually, I think it went the other way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, we went on a rail fanning trip one time, and uh, all those TPW units migrated west to uh, San Bernardino to get shopped, and that oh, was the yeah. first time I ever saw TPW anything. Um, that was a locomotive. That was great. That's and incredible. That, that's really cool. That's Denver about 1971, I think. This is, again, from Kevin yep. Udaley's collection. And, man, and everybody, if you want to send me the thank you note, about six months to a year ago, <laughs> I bought Alco Models Brass, <laughs> Jeep 30 and Jeep 30B. And I always say whenever I see someone has gone to all this trouble to either kit bash a plastic model or finally break down and buy brass, and then a real model gets announced, it's like, well, it's because of that guy. They did all the work. It's like, eh, there's a scale trains now. You didn't have to do that. So, man, this Jeep 30B. And Harry had some pictures and questions. I didn't realize that there are two, the passenger and freight. In fact, when I was reserving these, I was just going to get a 30 and a B. And then I saw there were two kinds of B. So I ended up having to buy both kinds of Bs. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah I mean, for me, it's, uh, yeah, the, these are the ones I've been waiting for, um, to be honest. I mean, I'm not a UP guy. Not really a UP fan, but I really like B units, cabless units, especially oh, cabless yeah. hood units. And for years, you know, even back in like the 80s and stuff, there was a company that was going to produce a Jeep 30B conversion kit, right? So oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Smoky Valley was a company name. And so yeah. Larry Jackman ran that company. Wow. Look at that shot. found the Jeep 30B conversion oh, oh, oh. kit. The Jeep 90s? Look at that. Yeah, look at this picture. Wow. You got a Jeep 30, a Centennial that's not lettered yet, a couple of Jeep 9Bs, one of your Jeep 30Bs, and then look, the first oh, car is a cattle car, and then a oh couple of open goodness. auto racks. That, that is, is an insane train. If, if yeah. some guy pulled this up at an operating session, I'd grab his throttle and get yeah. oh, it down. What the heck is <laughs> the that you got here? DD on its delivery run, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because uh, EMD back then, they – UP wanted to say, you know, look, we'll put on the lettering, we'll put in the radios, we'll put on the sunshades ourselves and save the ten dollars. EMD, <laughs> you just paint the thing, we'll stripe yeah. it too and letter it ourselves. And that's what yeah. UP did back in the 70s. And Paul, do you know how did this happen? Did they not have a jar of flocal harbor mist gray? I mean, how did that was, and was this did the museum paint it like this? Or it didn't didn't come from UP like this, did it? Um, I don't did think so. 
Um, again, I, I don't know all the particulars, but I mean, when when Mike and I were there, the, the unit looked like it was in, in relatively fresh paint. I mean, look, it was. In, I mean, the unit is the unit is, the unit is beautiful. You know how do you, no matter yeah. how. You work oh, it's, it's awesome! Yeah, but so it's so different. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. It runs, which is a really, which is another great attribute. You know, to the you know to, you know, to um, the efforts that museums go to to, you know, to preserve these locomotives. Yeah. So oh, it looks like one um, of my slides, Tony. Yeah. Thanks. Um, oh, nice. You know, I, I grew up. Um, on on the SP in Northern California, so I, you know I really didn't see cheap thirties much because like like um, you know Paul said they're pretty rare on the SP. You've got 1,200, 1,500 locomotives and what uh, ten or twenty or you know not even twenty cheap thirties barely. Right? Yeah, yeah, eighteen on the on eighteen, the SP. right? So fifty five thousand to seventeen, including the cotton belts. So I just never saw them. I'd see them like once a year. That was a big thing. Oh man, a cheap thirty just went by my window, yeah. but. If I walked, uh, but on my way to school, if I hit it just right, I would see the Santa Fe local cut through town, and it would always have a G30 or a G35 on it. In other words, one of each or combinations thereof. And so you're guaranteed to see Santa Fe G30s. G30s was all I would ever see on the Santa Fe when I grew up. And this is pretty much about how they appeared, you know, in the, either in the pinstripe or mm -hmm. in the yellow bonnet. And I, I really like the pinstripe with the silver trucks. Yeah, that looks sharp. And yeah. now, Paul, on this run, you're doing all of these. I think the like the major, like, spotting feature between Jeep 30s. I think what everybody calls it, phase one, phase two. Mm -hmm. The early phase has a shorter cab on this side only. Right. This is the phase two, so the cab, if you notice, is a little bit longer. Like the window looks like it's moved up a bit, and there's mm -hmm. no stanchion at the notch coming out onto the long hood. Uh, handrail set and this was done was it union pacific needed one more seat in that back corner or a that's union not, thing yeah that's the story apparently union pacific you know they wanted to have extra room for an extra seat for the to have a head end brake and riding on the trains and so they went to emd and said hey can you accommodate us and so emd solution was to add um extra about roughly approximately six inches to that side of the cab and like you said, as you pointed out, that affected the real stanchion. You, know, you had to eliminate that stanchion that, was, that would have normally been right behind the cab. And it um, added some extra length to the rear of the cab. And that also allowed you to have that extra extra head and brakeman seat. And you now then that 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 was that's results of what they, a lot of folks call the you know the phase two GT30. Hmm. So that's one of those um again, that's one of those different phase spotting features that uh, you know they're not officially documented. You know production changes you know, as far as most as far as the as far as EMD is concerned, but they are these little rail fan things that you know that we've noticed over the years as we're looking at them at the production of the prototypes and noticing little subtle changes, EMD or GE or whoever would have made to a particular model during its production times time frame. You know as far as you know like the like the cab like the cab difference on the GP30s. You've had the different, um, you know, the cab roof lap joints or seams on the roofs, you know, on the other as the production changes went along, um, you know, the sand filler placements, yeah, just little, little, just little quality of life changes or ease of ease of ease of construction or assembly change that EMD would make. Say, hey, this it's it's this is cheaper and better to produce it like this or use this gauge of metal or, you know, or put a weld here versus there, and you know, it's manifested in the in the model and on you know, the in production and then. For the modelers, it drives us nuts to try to make sure we get all those little details accurate. And the right. GB had a lot of those little subtle differences baked in over its production time frame. And yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize till digging through these pictures, and Harry, you probably know that's probably why you picked this. Mm -hmm. This is a rebuilt, and yep. the, the 30s had angled front windshields, and they flattened them for these Santa Fe's, right? Right. Yeah, yeah on, the, on the 30 use, like Paul was saying earlier. The other key thing that I – actually, this is where I start pushing product, right? So I'd love to see one like this because in the early 80s when they rebuilt them, not only did they flatten the windshield, but they also added all those wonderful hood stuff and fins on the top. Yeah. And the reason why all that stuff was there was to keep exhaust out of the intake and exhaust, uh, in, you know, not, not just – they just wanted clean air to breathe because that's what you need to breathe um, to, to make power, right? So – um, Santa Fe had, a, I guess, the far company salesman came by and says, hey, look, you know, you put these hoods on the unit and you put these fins up there, that'll keep the exhaust out of your intakes and uh, build, uh, allow you to develop more power. And so Santa Fe says, great, we'll take a couple hundred of those sets. And uh, they put that on everything. Wow, that's really the cool. The 80s, it really kind of gave a really cool look to these things. It looks like, you know, a bunch of guys running around with their, you know, labels turned up. 
you know, or, ra or range hoods or you know, kitchen ranges is what it's kitchen range hoods too. Yeah. <laughs> really awesome and uh you know with the air conditioning it really brought these units into the modern scene for me you know and and of course the blomberg trucks they they ripped off the uh oh, the, the great clasps the outer yeah. clasps and so forth and yeah, just really a neat look yeah and also a lot of a lot of the gp30s they also re they also um Restyled the area around the fuel filler, like this. Means they like cut away that skirting that surrounded the fuel filler. Oh, yeah, right. that's a good point. Or modified it. You know, in fact, this one. Yeah, here. yeah. So here's um. So you're probably wondering, hey, you know, uh, did Harry ever see any high nose Jeep 30s? I don't think anybody's ever wondering that, but I did. And uh, <laughs> back in the, uh, we had a in the summertime, me and my friends, we figure, hey, look, let's go jump on a plane and go see some weird trains. We're, we're don't want to see the SP. We don't want to see the Santa Fe. Let's go see something totally different. So we mm -hmm. flew out to Kansas City. We drove all the way up to uh, upstate Michigan. And on the way, we were cutting through Decatur. And uh, out west um, at Taylorsville, we ran into this, um, or ran across this uh, uh, auto parts train that had a G30 on the point. It was G30 on the point. Never saw one before. So we followed it for about 20 miles and shot the heck out of it. And that was a fun trip. So um, this is uh, my connection to the Norfolk and Western and their G30s. And boy, those wore, they, they came in the black with the rounded NW, the in it, not the hamburger, but the circle gotcha. with the curve, the NW, yeah, the guy, and then they went Pevler blue, but then almost immediately went black with the hamburger logo. And then 71 or two is this NW look. I mean, yeah, those 30s got all kinds of paint jobs. Yeah, yeah. And and again, the, the, these are just a, a series of Jeep 30B shots and, uh, I'm really happy to see these things in HO and um, in, in plastic. I never shelled out the money for a brass one or anything like that, but I always admired them. And here's one at San Bernardino with a dependable transportation lettering. That's just like yeah. what um, Scale Trains is doing in the first run. And it's this one is great. Behind it. Yeah, yeah. And check out check out the uh, – oh, yeah, it's Centennial. Yeah. So yeah. Um, check out the next one. So here's one um, between a couple of SD24s. Uh, oh, uh, another yeah. SD24B, nose to nose. And then that's probably an A or a B, um, you know, closest to the right hand of the picture. What's the straight pipe coming down about where the blower duct housing stops on the rear truck there? I see that in some of the other pictures too. I think it's some kind it's of gotta a, be drain. a drain it's thing, but yeah, yeah. Really on the B units. It's some kind of sump drain, I think, if memory serves me. But uh, yeah, the... yeah, MD typically has them closer to the fill tank, but on the Jeep 30, I guess anything goes. So wow, there's yeah, one like, on a passenger train. Look at that. Yeah. Chime in. Yeah, this is on train 28, I believe. Uh, if I'm looking at my notes correctly, uh, 714 ABB on train 27 and 20, 27 slash 28 at Cheyenne. Um, the photographer's name is John McQuig, or the in, in his collection anyway. And this is, I don't have a date on it, unfortunately. But that's uh, beautiful. It's really rare that you see pictures of these things. Um, the steam generator um, uh, G30Bs on a pa actual passenger train. Uh, the story goes that they were uh, used primarily on, on secondary passenger trains or Vietnam era troop trains because this is in the mid '60s when, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know the, the Vietnam conflict was going on, and uh, that's how they got the troops uh, out to port and uh, on the planes over to uh, over to that end of the world. So, and it is it is odd you don't see them that much, and that's what they were bought for, though, weren't they bought yeah. for mail or these secondary passenger trains? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pictures of them doing that, at least to me, I don't see a lot of them. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the photographers just didn't want to raise their cameras for it. You know, it could be just like, well, I wanted the E units instead or something. So, yeah, yeah. so these grungy GP30Bs and SDPs. Yeah, it's like, oh, we got the constellation yeah. prize, GP30B. Yeah, forget it. You know, so yeah. save my valuable stuff. Yeah. I love that. Oh, wow. Oh, this oh, is wow. crazy. Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I think this uh, power set shoving on that. A rickety wooden Rock Island caboose. So um, I probably wouldn't be in that caboose if I was him, but whatever. Yeah, are amazing. they on the? Are they helping? Are they switching in a yard? What are they doing? I'm not sure. You know, it's um. Let me go look at my. Yeah. yeah all I have is it's 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 at St. Paul, Minnesota, on the BN in July of '72. Wow. So well, I'll, I'll have to ask Jeremy Plant about that. I know Jeremy. I'll have to ask him what the story is because that's crazy. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So yeah, and here's a James Belmont shot of one out in Utah, and, and here again is a steam generator yeah, equipped G thirty B, and you can tell by the uh, the vents um, up uh, just up above where the cab would be. Yep. 
and I didn't realize that. What did what you call that, Paul, at the end of the where the walkway notches down by the rear truck? That's a filler oh, thing for the steam yeah. generator. Yeah, the water fill for the for the yeah. uh, for the water fill tank. In fact, in fact the yeah. Yeah, I think the SDP 45s and 40s had that as well in the same yep. location. Yep. Oh. Hmm. Yep. And, and I know here again, here's one. Um, or something, it seems. Pretty much uh, hooked up next to a U25 big. Hey, um, Tony, could you go back to the NNW um, GP30 that you were showing? The, the yeah. one in the box team. Uh, hang on one second. You're good. So, hey, I just wanted to tell everybody a real quick story about the NNW um, Black Scheme. So I was doing some research um, for the newsletter. And again, if you're not subscribed to the Scale Trains newsletter, go do that. Just go to the bottom of our the homepage on our website, enter your email there, and you'll get our newsletter. And we do so much more than just products. Um, we talk about prototype history. Um, you know, we, we've got an article about why railroads use ditch lights and the history behind ditch lights. We just do all kinds of different things like that. But uh, one of the things that I was doing while I was researching the, the NNW um, GP30s is that uh, NNW, the reason why they preferred black is because Stuart Saunders, who is the president of the NNW in the 50s and in the 60s, and, and well, he was there in the 50s and 60s, he said the reason why he preferred black is because that's the color that he wanted NNW's uh, finances to be in, is in the black. <laughs> and so that's why they stuck with it all those years. But it, additionally, too, you know, they NNW, um, if you read Ed Painter's article um, that we posted in this week's Time to Model, he said in his article that it's really hard to tell the difference between NNW blue and NNW black. That one there that Tony's showing is actually blue because that's got the hamburger logo there. No, um, but some, no some of them were black. There is were black they actually? hamburger. Yes, yeah. that I believe that's black. That wow. I had the same thing as I went through these. And there are some of the U-boats and other things are black with a hamburger logo, whether that was a repaint. But, yeah, I don't – I think that one is black because as I was trying to find pictures in the collection, I found a mix of Pebbler Blue and black Jeep 30s with this, like, 64 to early 70s hamburger logo. So hmm. That's wow. a really cool picture because of that nickel plate caboose. I mean, that had to have been right after the merger, too. And that's a wooden nickel plate caboose. That probably would have ran with the steam locomotive. So, yeah. Uh, but pretty cool. But what I was going to say is Ed Painter said it's really hard to tell the difference between the two yeah. because the NW ran so many coal trains and they'd get covered in coal dust. And NW was a very frugal railroad. And then you had the, you know, the, the crisis going on, the oil crisis in the 70s. And so they never spent the money to really keep, keep their locomotives looking good. They just ran them. And, uh, so go check out that Time to Model article. It's really interesting. I want to uh, take some time now to open it up uh, with, as we come to our close here. This has been a great live stream so far. I just want to thank everybody on the stream here with me. Um, and I also want to thank all of our viewers for, for hanging out here. So far, right now, we have about 140 people watching pretty much the entire time. We've had around that number of people watching. So um, really appreciate you guys hanging out with, with us and having this conversation. I want to open it up to uh, viewer questions now. Um, there were a few questions um, up towards the top. I'm going to scroll through the chat here that I that I wanted to address, um, mostly future road names and things like that. Um, since we were just talking about it, can we eventually do the NNW block scheme, just the NNW lettering? Uh, that's on the to-do list, um, kind of like the one that Harry was showing in those pictures. Um, the, the reason, and, and Paul, maybe you can speak to this. The reason we went with blue is because uh, there the blue hasn't been offered in HO in a really long time. And there was another manufacturer that offered them in black recently. So the blue will allow NW modelers to add some variety to their layout if they've already purchased other GP30s. So just kind of add some variety. The black units will come in the future. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. We've got some questions about Sioux line. And they're also a good companion to the to the Pevler Blue um, SD forty fives you offered in a, in a recent run as well. So, yes, yes, um, Sioux Line. What about Sioux Line, Paul? Um, again, in, in the future, there's a and there's a lot of variations that we'll that we've tooled up or we intend to tool and that we'll be offering in the future. So, um, Sioux Line, which also went to Wisconsin Central, if memory serves me. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a again a, most any um, GP thirty paint scheme is fair game at some point. You know, there's like so there's a lot of ground we can cover. 
Let's see. Uh, GMO, again, that's uh, definitely a uh, on the potential road name list. Um, here's a comment from SP Scotty. I'm thrilled that Scale Trains is offering the Rio Grande units in the later eras. I hope the f I hope in the future you do the lower number units in the late era too. Yeah, again, that's a, another possibility. You know, we've still—I mean, obviously, we got to get the uh, more of the earlier as delivered, or you know, late '60s, early '70s era stuff. But um, again, more variations and more, more, more paint, paint scheme variations and era variations will will come as we go along with the project. It's uh, can't give away too much, but there is a lot. There is a lot that we plan to do with the thirty project. And again, there's a lot of a uh, lot of ground to cover. We can't unfortunately do it all right out of the gate, but uh, yeah, there will be a lot. Will be there will be a lot more coming. I just had a, if I can find my phone, let me check it real quick. <laughs> I just got a text message from Ed Painter. So <laughs> hi, Ed. Uh, he says, more NNW 500 series GP30s were repainted black with the Hamburger Heralds than blue with Hamburger Heralds. So from the NNW expert, there we there have it. So, thanks for that clarification there, Ed. Awesome. And thanks for Thank your... You, Ed. Ed's a great guy. I met him at the St. Louis RPM and we talked for a bit. Yeah, it's, he, he is a wealth of information. I've emailed with him since. Let's see. We got a Stephen Seifert says, I believe LNN 1030, a non dynamic unit, has a plate over the valley where the dynamic brake fan would normally be located. LNN mm -hmm. 1014 was also EMD's 25,000 production diesel unit. That's a pretty cool mm -hmm. bit of information. Paul, I noticed. On some of the the GP30 models on the roof lines, it's there's like a square housing where the fan actually is, and then I think, and I could be wrong, on the 844, it's almost like a notched, like that dynamic brake fan is kind of like notched in. Was that because they rebuilt them, or is that a production thing? Uh, production that was on units that had extended range dynamic braking. If I remember, if, oh, uh, cool. that little this section up in. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that was like a little brass detail part somebody offered or an etched metal thing, but it's lovely to see that. Yeah, in fact, um, that's, original, that's original then, Harry? Jeep 30s had extended dynamics, or that's done later? That was yeah, a customer option. Get that. Yeah. yeah, customer option. And, and that's, uh, a delivery. that's an option by uh, EMD when the EMD salesman comes. Do you want extended range or just regular? And in fact, um, my friend Dick Harley came through. He had some nice photos. Oh, nice photos of, of GP30s in various states of distress after they've been retired. And there was a nice overhead shot that he provided to us of a, a UP GP30 with that, um, there's a, a an access door that, that sits you know, on the side on the side of the housing, right adjacent to that that, uh, that box in the area you're talking about. And in the photo, he was retired unit in the photo, the door was hanging open and you can see the cabling and stuff that was going inside there and snaking through around through that um, that housing all to the, to the other side. So that again, that, that was- That angled housing. Yeah, so that was your uh, electrical, that routed, that routed your cable for the extended range dynamic equipment. So uh, I like this comment here from Steven Steifert. It says, do us, in parentheses, me a favor, and don't do Southern ACL, SAL and LNN all in the same release. I can't- <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Hey, yeah. there's a comment in here about B&O Sunburst GP30s. That would be pretty cool, and I'm sure that we, we'd consider offering those. Um, Aaron Adams asks, are the original cab BN and BNSF GP39Ms on the list too? I'd prefer those over the GP39Vs since they're more common here in the Pacific Northwest. Paul, can you explain that? I know there's a GP39E, V, and, and R. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah GP39E, V, and M. Um, again, that, that suffix denoted what, what um, contradicted the work, whether it was V for VMV, E for EMD, or M for Morrison Newton. And um, each each rebuilder had their had a little bit of a different spin in how they rebuilt the units. Some units, like those ten former Southern units that EMD rebuilt, they got the entire front end replaced. Whereas other ones, you know, some of the, some of the changes were pretty benign. Like okay, like maybe they pulled off one of the, that center radiator for thirty six inch fan on the you know, between the forty eight inch fans. Other ones were almost indistinguishable for indistinguishable indistinguishable. Excuse me, from a stock GB thirty. You know, aside from a new fresh paint job and a new new number series, but 
you know, again, it's there's a lot of variations we'll do, and I know it's the same stock answer, but you know, there's a lot of variations we we, we, we intend to do, and we will try to cover as we're going along with the project. Hmm. So you know, various rebuilds and different flavors are that's definitely part of the part of the uh, part of the plans here. Someone someone uh, earlier said I want a Mopac GP30, but they never had them. I yeah. do. Too. I'll take one. Yeah. They sound look kind of cool with Type B trucks. I could kind of see that. Oh, Considering that their Jeep 18s were like that. <laughs> hey, I have a GP30, Paul, that we just have to make. And if we don't make it, I think I'm going to have a meltdown. Are you ready to see this? <laughs> this We just have to do this. That is a, a that is actually a GP30. What? That's a 30? Uh, Yes, it is. So, so me being a Southern Railway nerd, uh, I had to share this story. Uh, so GP30 number 2641 was wrecked shortly after it was delivered to the Southern. And uh, Southern wanted to get it repaired. And EMD said, well, we're sorry. We don't have any GP30 frame or not frames, but GP30 bodies, hoods. We don't have any GP30s left. So how about we send you a GP35 car body and you can just put that on top of the GP30 frame since they shared the same frame. So 2641 was unique in that it had a GP35 car body, but internally it was a GP30. And uh, it's kind of interesting. So this photo here uh, is actually a pair of GP30s. And uh, this well, locomotive... Yeah, the frame is different though. I mean, it's, it looks That's like it's got wild. the... Yeah, if you go back to that other photo, I mean, that looks like that looks like, that looks like a late production GP thirty five frame. You know, it's got the deeper, the deeper fuel tank. Deeper you know, still, yeah, it's a phase two. That's a phase two thirty five. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, something else going on there too. I yeah, know. that's that missing duck. I'm not sure, but that that's that's what happened, and and uh, it's hmm. actually not too far from Scale Train's headquarters. So uh, R J Corman had the locomotive for a short time in. Uh, of course, you know, GP 30s being prone to the electrical problems that they had, the, uh, the, the locomotive died on them and they said, ah, it's too expensive to rebuild. So let's, let's put it on display. And it's actually on display in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and, uh, it's gutted. There's no prime mover or anything like that, but it's on display and you can go see it and, uh, get up and close and personal, but, uh, yeah, that'd be worth measuring for something. Yeah. Say that again. I said, that'd be worth measuring for something. Yeah, I hate to interrupt for a little bit, but I, I kind of got to get going because I've got another commitment tonight. Yeah, but, no problem. Uh, really great to be on tonight, and thank you so much for Tony and, and Paul and Drayton and the whole gang here, um, all you guys for um, allowing allowing me to kind of chime in here and there. So um, I'm really happy about this Jeep 30 project and um, seeing this thing come to life and uh, looking forward to uh, these things hit the market, man. I'm I'm going to be looking for the for our um, Express Courier very soon. <laughs> Likewise. Well, we really appreciate you being here tonight, Harry. And uh, whatever you got going on, hope it goes well. Thanks for being here with us. And uh, yeah. this Absolutely. actually would be a pretty good time to sign off. Um, just before we close, though, I want to say, uh, like we mentioned earlier, for those who didn't see it in the stream, and Harry, if you got to go, feel free to sign off. Yeah, yeah. But for, those, for those who missed it, um, we it, uh, on the GP30 slug segment, if you have photos that can help us uh, with any of these changes that need to be made with the deco samples, send us an email, sales at scaletrains.com. We really would appreciate that. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, see you later. Here. Um, Tony, thanks so much for the amazing photos. And Paul, of course, thank you for all of your prototype knowledge. And uh, we really appreciate you guys spending almost two hours. So and we never ran out of anything to talk yeah. about. So say this with is your, with, this is jeep 30s we can keep talking go ahead drain whatever you got to do paul and i'll keep talking jeep 30s <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot for I'll, having me guys i really appreciate it it's so uh, awesome this is a, this is gonna be a fantastic model absolutely absolutely well uh tony you're signing off from kansas city area paul you're signing off from the west coast and i am signing off here from east tennessee uh, everybody, to learn more about our products, visit scaletrains.com. Thanks for tuning in. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank you. Take care. Good night, everybody.